I just want to take a moment and talk about why we want to do this. The idea of having people share their personal struggles is because in our business, I get to speak to people that have various health conditions in the day to day. And often, the common theme amongst these people are that they feel isolated and they feel alone in their condition. And to me, being on the receiving end of it, I think to myself, I've just spoken to three people that have the same condition as you do today. So I'm hoping that through having these conversations with people and them sharing their personal struggles, we can empower those with hope, with guidance, and even speak about some of the pitfalls that they might face down the line. That's why we do it. Where'd you get this blue mark? <laughs> What's wrong with me is I have a nervous tic disorder. Why do you want to talk about it today? I've never spoken about it until today because I'm still so ashamed about it. You're a successful businesswoman. I don't want to say it's an abnormality because it makes it sound so negative. Yeah, one shouldn't take life so seriously. Today we're welcoming a very special guest to the podcast. This person is an animal fanatic, a entrepreneur, businesswoman, a new mom, and most importantly, my favorite person. Oh, what an introduction. <laughs> Daniela, I think we're going to cut right to the chase and, and ask you the big question, here, and that, that is, what is wrong with you? So, uh, what's wrong with me is I have a nervous tic disorder. Why, why do you want to talk about it today? I think the reason I want to talk about it is the fact that it's so difficult for me to talk about means that there's so many other boys, girls, women, men out there that probably have the same condition and are also ashamed to talk about it. I think that is quite noble. I know you very well. You know, we've been together for a long time, so I do know how difficult this conversation is for you. And the reason I want to start off by you being very specific about why you want to talk about it is because I want to really keep that in mind the conversation because I know it's going to get difficult but if we know why we're doing something it makes it easier to do something mm -hmm. and for whom we're doing something now a tick disorder is I think a vague no vague isn't the right word I think it's a very misunderstood issue it aligns very closely with like Tourette syndrome they tend to kind of go hand in hand but they vary specifically on one element but for those out there who don't know what a tic disorder is, and just specifically, you know, on one aspect, like what it is, and then another one will talk about what it actually means to you. It's basically, I'd say, uncontrollable movements that you would have or do um, during the day. Mm. Um, it can be subtle. Um, it can be not subtle at all. Um, it comes in all movements, forms. Um, but I think the, the, the crux of it is that it's basically uncontrollable. Like a spasm? Yes. Mm. Okay, so I get that that is what it is objectively. Mm -hmm. You know, like a neurological, um, a neurological issue that causes a spasm. But when, when did it start for you? Like when do you remember you first having this situation? So I actually remember, because um, I met my dad for the first time when I was like 10. Mm -hmm. And when I met him, I noticed that he had like movements that he would do, but his were quite um, obvious. I think he had a, probably a more extreme form of it. And What's an example? Like his head head twitches, um, like blinking, but like very excessively, and like it wasn't even blinking; it was sort of like closing your eyes for mm -hmm. quite a long time. And but it was stuff like that, very noticeable movements, and I noticed that. And I think then I started noticing things on myself after, because I don't think I'd ever actually seen anyone else have, like, do those type of things. And then I started noticing things yeah, on myself when I was around 10. But it was still very subtle. I, I didn't think anything of it. And I think when I was around... And what, what were you noticing? I think just, like, it, repetitive movements that I would do and that I could not not do. Mm -hmm. Do you have one that comes to mind? Yeah, like a shoulder shrug. Or similar blinking to my dad. Um, I think the first one that I ever had that I really noticed was, I'm going to call it the head shakes. I don't know how else to explain it, but it would mm -hmm. be like shaking my head, basically. 
um, from side to side, but like quickly. Just like once or twice. It wasn't like I was doing it the whole time, just like once or twice, and then that would be the tick. And then I would do it again, um, maybe 10 minutes later, whatever it is. And that was the first one I noticed. And the reason I noticed it is because I went to school with someone who did that the whole, almost the whole time. And people would actually make fun of him. And I think because I've, I'd seen it, he had it a lot earlier on than, than mine developed, I suppose. I knew that it was something different mm -hmm. that not everyone does. And then when I met my dad and I also saw him do things that not everyone does, I realized, okay, this is, um, this is different. You know, it's, I'm going to call it, it's an, I don't want to say it's an abnormality because it makes it sound so negative. Yeah. But yeah, that's how I saw it. And the older I became, I think the more excessive they became. And I learned stress is a major trigger. Mm. The more I stress, that would like really onset different forms. And what's weird is it's almost like you have to have five at a time. And then when you somehow lose one and like I would celebrate it, I'm like, oh, I haven't done this in days. It's gone. Then I'll pick up a new one. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, can't I win? Um, that is quite funny. Yeah. yeah so, it's like this, this capacity, you know, like a, like a battery that has like five slots. And if you lose one slot, it just needs to be replaced with another with thing. With another one, yeah. yes. So yeah, that, that's when I started noticing it. And I think from there it sort of went downhill mm. I, because it started becoming more obvious and my parents started noticing and they didn't handle it very well. Um, and that made it so much worse, which is why I've never, like, I've never spoken about it until today because I'm still so ashamed about it because... Mm. I was made to feel like there's something wrong with me or I shouldn't do it. Um, what are people going to think? But it was so difficult because it wasn't a choice. Yeah. I couldn't choose not to do it. See, that's a misconception, right? One of the misconceptions is, first of all, that it's very rare. And what we find is that almost one in a hundred people have it. That's yeah. not very rare. It's actually fairly common. Yeah. And then another thing that you've, you've mentioned now is the fact that, you know, you had parents telling you, you know, knock it off, stop doing it, what are people going to think? And truly, it's not an option. It's not up to you to decide whether you do it or not. I know there's a, an element of suppression that you can do for a very temporary time. But after right, that, it's that like... Because it comes back excessively. Yeah, and that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. You know, like you, you, if you, if, yeah, that's, that's the part. That's also a misconception that people think that you can control it, where you really can't. You can suppress it for a momentary time, but it does come. I think that's a good way of putting it. You can suppress it. Like, if you're sitting in an interview and you're like, okay, go for it, you yeah. can. But then after the interview, like, it is going to be quite excessive. Hmm. So you're not controlling it, you're just that's delaying it. it. Exactly. Look, the theme here is obviously this, where it started was how the people that were closest to you, how they reacted to the situation. Yeah, this is really what caused this spiral down where you are now. You were just so mm -hmm. incorrectly ashamed of it. And I say that on purpose because I fundamentally feel like I've been with you for so long and it's genuinely not an issue. But the only one that makes an issue or thinks about it as an issue is the person that obviously has it. And like yeah. that's personal to you and you know what that feels like and your experience is unique to you. Mm -hmm. But then I want to ask you, really is if you were talking to a parent okay you have a parent who has a child and they're starting to develop it because the age kids start to develop it is between the ages of five and seven that's sort of the age group what advice are you giving to a mom who might be now seeing signs of a tick disorder in her child for the first time i think not to see it as something that's wrong with them because there isn't anything wrong with them. That's who they are. It's how they were born. It's like someone that's born with missing an arm. That's how they were born. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with them. I think the worst thing you can do is to tell them, um, stop, don't do that. Or what are you, the worst, the, the worst questions I ever got is what are you doing? Like, because it does so much damage in the long run. I mean, I'm 29 now mm. and I'm still struggling every day to to accept that that part of me i don't know if i'll ever accept it because i think it's such deep trauma in me so what i would the advice that i would give is make it seem like it's normal if they if your children want to talk to you about it they will approach you and ask you about it 
but don't make it seem like you know there's something wrong with them they need to see someone because of it they need to see a doctor whatever it is yeah I think the main thing is you need to be supportive and you just need to accept them for who they are it's really important that people understand that fundamentally most people that have these tick disorders even Tourette's they live perfectly normal lives um, most ticks aren't even noticeable they're noticeable mm-hmm. to you because you have them but to most people we don't even notice them yeah you know it took me quite a long time into our relationship to even notice you had it and we've been dating for like 13 years so I mean that, that does say quite a lot about the nature of it that it feels like it's out there like you're wearing a flag and everyone is just looking yeah. at you and judging you yeah. meanwhile everyone is so caught up in their own shit like they don't have time to really think about anyone else's stuff uh, the difference is obviously when you're a kid and kids bully each other tremendously yeah. that's a whole different story but I mean once you get older people don't even have time to think about that yeah. Um, if we talk about the difference between Tourette's and, and a nervous tic disorder, is that the difference comes in that Tourette's has a vocal and a motor component. So which means it's a movement for motor and a vocal that they need, they need to talk. It has both, whereas a tic disorder can have one or the other. Mm-hmm. And especially in, in girls or females, it's actually less prevalent. I think it's they, the statistic is, and we might need a fact check here, but like three out of the four cases are boys that have it as opposed to girls wow. so that's quite interesting that it's more of a prevalent issue in, in, in boys and I think that kind of leads me to the next question where I'm like well we have a little girl and have you knowing that there's a genetic component and it's hereditary how do you think about that when looking at a Tara who's now two years old or almost two years old I think I'm so hypersensitive to it I think any little thing that she does and she's still so small I'm like Marco, what is if what is if she has this? Mm-hmm. No, and I think the way you, you always handle it, and like, well, what if she does? So what? It doesn't matter. Whereas I approach it, and I see all the negative sides to it, like, but how is she going to get treated, and how's you know how she going to be perceived, and that's just because of how it was handled when I was young. So I think that fear element is only there because of how I felt, how I felt, and how I feel about it. Whereas you obviously approach it from a very, you know, different angle that it just really doesn't matter. There's a person I'm going to plug on this podcast now. And like, I mean, she's she's quite famous amongst the YouTubers. Her name is Swedenita. And she's someone who has Tourette's, but on quite a severe level. And she didn't, she wasn't able to really do anything work-wise. But she said, okay, well, if I can't do anything, let me start streaming. And it turned out to be a huge strength in her favor. Because it made her unique and relatable and even people that don't have Tourette's or tic disorder they could they could just find the hu- the human element in her situation and she became incredibly popular and very inspirational and even on a scale where you know I think they say about 27% of people that have Tourette's actually have it to a point where it's limiting the, the most people don't have that, that, that situation but even when you're on that level there are ways to find a strength and a weakness you know it, it isn't your end or be all yeah. And I mean, you're a case in, in point in that where you're a successful businesswoman. You have a fantastic daughter. Uh, you're a great mom. It really hasn't limited you at all, if I really think about it. Like, I've had, the, I would struggle to think about how it might have limited you, apart from the, the, the emotional distress yeah. situation. But like, from a, anywhere else, if it's even sports, athletics, health, nutrition, like, the, I don't see an area where it really has limited you. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true it's it's not exactly a limitation to like what I can do in life I think it's very fair point to say it's really just the emotional element yeah. where I felt limited or that's I think like the daily struggle yeah that being said though <laughs> something does happen from time, from time to time, to time. <laughs> yeah. and I I like to laugh about it because I think it, it's it's a part of life yeah mm-hmm. and I think one should try find the funny in it Otherwise, what's the real point here? Because that life, life, no, the, the saying is one shouldn't take life so seriously, yeah. Because then you're doing it wrong. So, tell me about any of these personal injuries you might have. I'd say the most recent one was probably I had a knee injury. Knee <laughs> injury. <laughs> tell me about this knee injury. So I had a, a leg twitch, and I hit my leg, my knee actually into the corner of the cupboard. And I had a bruised knee for like a week. It was also bleeding. It was like a proper like injury. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. And from time to time, those things do happen. You know, if you 
hit something in the way, whatever it is. So that was the most the most recent one. I've had a few of those though. It is it is funny though that on, on occasion I'll be like, where'd you get this blue mark? <laughs> <laughs> Well, where's that scratch from? Why what, are you bleeding? <laughs> so it looks—it looks like you—it looks like I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, uh, I'm abusive. <laughs> um, but yeah. That, Let the record hold. That is not what's going that, on in that, our household. That's true. Let the record say. Sure. How do you say it? Show. Let the sure. record show. I don't know. Something I think it's like let the record show. <laughs> Point is, I'm gonna clip this and keep it forever in case anything ever happens. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, been said, it's been said. Um, the the only part we haven't yet discussed, and I think this is quite. It's uh, quite adept to your situation. You did look for ways if you could treat this, yeah. you know. Um, and knowing that it's neurological, what what did you do? I didn't actually go to a doctor to treat this specifically. I don't know if you remember, but it was for my migraines that I was having. Right. Really bad migraines that I would get like almost every day, and I was popping painkillers every single day, like it was bad. Mm-hmm. And I went to a neurologist to see just to do tests like CAT scan you know all of the obvious things like is it something serious that could be causing this and when I went for all these scans and tests it turned out it was just it was a chemical imbalance is what the neurologist said I had that was causing my migraines but the interesting thing is he said it was also tied to my tics so they were they were actually going hand in hand and he did give me medication for it I don't for the life of me remember what it is I know the other day we were trying to figure it out as well and it took away my migraines and it actually really reduced my tics like significantly. I know we were we were speaking about it with a friend and I was like, I actually don't even remember having one today or yesterday. Like mm. it was such a massive change. But I had such bad side effects from those tablets. Like I lost so much weight. I remember you literally force feeding me on days because I just wouldn't eat. Like I felt so sick, I had no appetite. And it messed with my cognitive abilities. I literally couldn't think. People would explain things to me. I couldn't grasp the concept. And we were writing the finals at that point in time. So I just, I had to stop taking them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was worse than when you had pregnancy brain. It was so bad. I remember... And pregnancy brain was intense. I don't even think they should let people drive with that stuff. I remember sitting uh, yeah. at a robot and like, oh, traffic light, whatever you call it. I know there's different types yeah. of it. At a traffic light. And it went green. And people started hooting at me. And honestly, to me, the that traffic light. light was red. And then only eventually, like, it's like you click out of this zombie state that you're in. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm supposed to be driving. Like, mm. people should not be allowed to drive on that stuff. It well, if crazy. that's the case, no BMW driver should ever be allowed to drive. So I feel like that's just how they <laughs> drive not. normally <laughs> on nothing at all. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the part that's interesting then is it took away something that was quite emotionally important to you, but it had severe consequences. Was it worth it to you? Taking the tablets? Yeah, at the expense of the side effects. I actually regret taking them. The main reason is because this, I know I can't take them again. <laughs> and I feel bad for saying this because I'm sitting here trying to advocate for people to accept this, but I think it's just so deep rooted in me to be so ashamed of it that it's still difficult for me to say, to easily say, oh, accept it, because it, for me it's not easy. So. I I regret taking them because not taking them again means I don't know if there's anything out there again that will have worked so well for this because the side effects were just too intense. As a mom especially, I can't not have my cognitive abilities working properly as a a business leader, definitely not. So, yeah. I think it's one of those where you say, do as I say but not as I do situations. It's like, "This this is not what I'd recommend to my daughter. But I know that it's an issue that I have with myself. Yeah. Even coming to terms with. Yeah, so it's easy for me to say to all the parents out there as well, you know, accept them, there's nothing wrong with them. And then here I'm sitting saying, well, you know, I'm still ashamed about and it. And worried about but, it for your child, yeah. But the only reason is because of how it was treated when I was a child. Mm. If, if it wasn't treated in, in such a way, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now being so deeply ashamed about it. And it's interesting because now I can speak about it openly. Before we did the podcast, I had to say a sentence and say out loud, my mm-hmm. name is Daniela and I have a nervous twitch disorder. And it took me a while. I started crying because <laughs> I just couldn't get it out. And it was the first time like I actually said, said that with my name in the sentence, which is, I'm 29. That's crazy. So, Well, here yeah. you said it. I mean, now I've said it again. Times. Yeah. That's why I wanted to 
really end this. And I think you said that I don't know if I'll ever get over this. And I, it's very evident from today that I definitely think you will, you've broken the cycle. Yeah. And this is definitely a cycle that will be broken if it ever were to happen to our daughter. Maybe this is a great way to accept it, to look, being able to look in the mirror and say it out loud, being able to stand in front of your and friends mm. and say it out loud, in front of your family members and say it out loud. Because I think once you say it, it almost you start accepting it. Once you are able to You take to the say power it away from, what it, from yeah. the control it has over you. Yeah. yeah. And I can um, see that now. Like Voldemort. When you say Voldemort, you take away the power. <laughs> Oh um, my gosh, you had to throw in some Harry Potter well, there. Well, we do love <laughs> Harry Potter, that's true. Mm. But yeah, Daniela, I, I think it's, I'm, I know what it took for you to say this stuff today and just have the conversation. In, and hopefully if anyone wants to, wants to go deeper into certain elements of it, I think we definitely can. But I'm really proud of you that you did this today. Thank just you. truly <laughs> am. So on behalf of anyone that I think will be inspired by that, I think I also want to thank you for that. Um, I hope I was able to inspire or help some people that, that have this to just feel a bit better about it. Yeah.